Um, so, uh, hello and, and welcome to uh, this uh, eighth Key Opinion Leader uh, webinar. So, uh, this week we have Dr. Claire Mitchell. I'd like to introduce her first of all. Hello, so, again. Hi, Claire. <laughs> It always happens that someone ends up on mute. Unfortunately, it was me this week. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining us, Claire. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to go through some housekeeping rules. Um, so um, the way that you interact with us, um, if you've got any questions, please go through the uh, Q&A uh, function. Uh, and basically, any questions that you have, put them through there. And then we can then keep an eye on those and try and get through as many of those as we can. Obviously, what I'll try to do is, is pop those in at a timely fashion, as long as uh, Claire is able uh, to answer those straight away. If not, we'll come back to those at the end. Um, it, the session is recorded, um, so a few of you have asked for the sort of PowerPoint in the past, but actually it's probably better to either go to the Oster Academy YouTube uh, account um, or to perhaps go to our website. So if you search Oster webinars, all the references um, and any supporting materials that go along with that, as well as the full presentation uh, in the in the video, uh, will be there for you to to reference. So um, please uh, refer to that. Um, there'll also be a certificate sent out uh, in the in the coming week, um, so you can access that. Um, and if you just save that as a PDF, a um, few of you have said with uh, Gmail accounts, for example. Um, you struggle to save that as a PDF, but if you open it in Chrome, you can actually just save as, and it then will uh, save as, as a PDF. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, what I'll do is tell you a little bit about Claire. Um, so she's one of the most uh, respected uh, and research active rehabilitation and condition specialists in the UK. Uh, she's worked in the field of sports medicine and health for 20 years now as a senior lecturer, researcher, consultant, and practitioner. Um, designed, led, and managed major clinical and non-clinical research trials, um, supervised several PhD students, and has published over 30 papers in leading peer-reviewed peer uh, sports medicine journals. Claire's area of expertise, uh, Claire's area of expertise means that she uh, uniquely spans the gap between physiology of conditioning and physiotherapeutic rehabilitation. Um, she's a principal researcher at the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Orthopedic Hospital, and the director of Get Back to Sport. Okay, um, so I'm going to pass over to you now, Claire, um, and uh, uh, I'll I'll drop in with any questions as we go through. Super. So thank, thanks for that introduction. Um, so let me just share my screen with you. Hopefully this goes well. There we go. Uh, oh, is that all okay? Can we see that? Is that fine? Yeah, absolutely fine. Super. Uh, hello everyone, I uh, just want to say thanks to, to Oster, it's always a delight to, uh, to do things with you guys. Uh, Honoured to contribute to this webinar series following some really esteemed uh, presenters, so um, absolutely, um, as I said, honoured to, to, I think, be the, the last in this uh, small block. So um, what I wanted to do today is have a look at rehab and cognizant of this this lockdown period that we've been in um it's obviously a huge topic um we haven't got time to cover all elements um but what i did want to do is try and bring out some key things that we should maybe start to think about and things that we can actually um modify change and affect so just three things really I want to try and, and address. One, what are some of the likely consequences of lockdown on particularly muscle performance? How might things change um, with the patterns of behavior that people are now adopting? And again, that's a, a huge topic in itself. So we'll try and niche that down to, to get some uh, distinct answers. And then looking at this hierarchy of importance, um, as with any rehab setting, whether it is post lockdown or whether it's the first time we see a, a patient, there's often a lot to focus on. So how can we start to order of, um, or, or prioritize what we should be looking at and, and when and try to get some kind of sense to that. And then once we've achieved that, then how can we start to optimize the outcomes of what you want to achieve with your patients? Very briefly, um, I've just seen a few in, in the chat, so I know some of you know me already. 
for those that don't, um, whistle stop tour on my background so you get an idea of where I'm coming from um, with this information. Um, so as uh, Gerald uh, has, has already said, um, I've been a, an academic for a, a number of years, so I set up and uh, managed the sports medicine degree program, for example, at Nottingham Trent University. Um, I've been and continue to be uh, a researcher, so that's something I'm really passionate about and applying that research into practical situations. So it's all well and good doing research for the sake of research, but really we need that to translate into practice. And, and that's what I really enjoy doing. So talking with, with you guys that are at the, the coal face and trying to affect change in, in patients. Uh, I'm also a practitioner in that I see people towards end stage of rehab to getting back to sport, but more so I'm more passionate right now um, about bettering um, I suppose treatment of osteoarthritis, particularly OANE. So I run a, uh, an OANE uh, program and looking at how we can optimize some of the muscular uh, conditioning to help attenuate symptoms there. I've been an athlete, so I've managed to implement some of the evidence-based knowledge to, to hone my performance in, in some arenas quite successfully. And I've also been a patient. So I really empathize what it's like to lie there counting ceiling tiles <laughs> in a hospital. So that's, I kind of occupy that sweet spot there. You can see on the right hand side, some of my collaborators um, and partners and people that, that I've, I've worked with and worked for. So um, I like to make sessions as much as possible interactive and um, uh, Giles and, and Stuart have, have encouraged that I use polls in this situation. So let's just chuck out a, a poll at you. If you've en attended any of these webinars before, then you're probably familiar with this. So I'd like to know a little bit, little bit about you. So what is your role? What's your occupation? Um, there's, a, there's a list there that should have come up on your screen. So are you a consultant, a physio, orthotist, podiatrist? Are you involved more in exercise? So just get a little bit of a, a feel for this esteemed audience. <laughs> so we have, uh, we already have 75 of uh, people have answered. Okay. Um, so, I'll just leave it up for another few seconds. Um, and then we should be good to go. So I'll just end it there and then share that with you. So you can see that we have um, a couple of doctors and consultants, 80% um, physiotherapists, 8% uh, orthotists, yes, occupational yes. therapists. Um, we have 1%. Um, PT or exercise specialists, we have 2%. Um, one podiatrist. Um, three chiropractors or osteopaths and uh, uh, six percent other in the other category I know what it's like to be in that other category I'm always in that category other <laughs> so it's the best category to be but welcome you're all welcome thank you for sharing that um, so overwhelmingly we've got um, I suppose a physiotherapy audience but no doubt if you've registered for this email uh, email <laughs> webinar then you've got at least some interest in exercise and rehabilitation so I, I hope to, to deliver your expectations or on your expectations for that. So lockdown, so prior to lockdown, then we lived a, a very busy, active life, interacting with lots of people. So then with lockdown coming, um, then the consequences of that have meant that, you know, we've just had to sit back and chill, drink coffee, Relax, you know, it's not, it's not been like that at all, has it? It's been uh, maybe initially the, with the, the novelty of it, perhaps, but it's been quite a turbulent time and it's inevitably brought many changes. And that means empty gyms. So we haven't been able to visit those environments that we have in the past, or indeed you haven't been able to send your, your patients there. And those exercise pursuits where people have managed to keep them have become quite a solitary thing and there's invariably been changes to people's physical activity so that might well have gone down uh, it might well have gone up um, or indeed changed actually in terms of what we're or what your patients are doing what you've been doing perhaps have you been on the, the Joe Wicks um, PE sessions and contributed to that spike in MSK problems because everyone just diving in doing a whole volume of novel exercise but what has likely 
uh, happened is that there's been a substantial decrease in the extent of loading of the musculoskeletal tissues. And I don't mean volume of loading or period of loading, I mean the actual forces going through those tissues. And that can have significant implications. So trying to frame this, this question of kind of post lockdown rehab, what kind of changes are we expecting? Well, and then what's the focus on? If we think about dynamic joint stability, so what makes a joint stable or indeed unstable in any one moment in time? And we've got you know, significant demands that we're placing on that system or those systems. Um, certainly if you've got athletic populations as patients, or indeed if you're trying to avoid falling over, having for, um, tripped over a curb, you've got this complex interaction of the kind of broadly passive structures and then active structures. Responsiveness and rapidity of responsiveness is far less than on the active side of that model, which is the musculature. And this is where the neuromuscular function comes in. So how do we know how well the musculature is performing and such that it's able to deliver the right amount of force in the right time to stabilize the joints um, every single time is needed? Then we're thinking about measuring aspects of performance or function like strength. And we'll focus a lot on strength in this presentation because it's really important and I'll explain why. Um, but that's not to say that I don't think the other things are important as well. They are very important. So the rate of force production or power, we'll have a little, uh, little bit on that as well, but also how quickly muscles can switch on and also the proprioceptive sensory motor ability. So all of that needs to be working optimally to make sure that everything goes to plan. Now, as I said, I'm going to focus uh, predominantly on muscle strength uh, for, uh, for a multitude of reasons. But before we do that, I'd just like to ask you, um, maybe some of you have answered this for me before, if you've done any of my courses, and I sort of noticed a couple of you in there, and hello to everybody that, that has. Um, I just want to ask you, have you got an idea of what muscle strength is? It's something dead simple, we think. And I've just given you three options there. So the poll should have appeared on your screen. So what, what's muscle strength? Is it something like the ability to perform activities of daily living or sport without fatiguing? Is it the ability of the muscular to repeatedly contract against resistance? Or is it the maximal contractile force of a muscle, maybe in a single effort? Okay, we so we have... Else? Yeah, we've got about 65% uh, of answered, so we'll just give it another, another 10 seconds We're not or quite so. sure, go on, plump, plump for <laughs> it, but we're not going to pull you out. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll stop it there and then share those results. So you can see that 10% have said it's the ability to perform activities of daily living sport without fatiguing. 25% uh, said it's the ability of muscles to repeatedly contract against resistance. Um, and 66% is the maximal uh, contractile force of a muscle in a single effort. Great. Thank you for that. And thank you for responding. Um, okay. So the answer is that the maximal contractile force in a single effort. Now, those other things are important. They are important and will be determined in, by some extent about the by the level of muscle strength that you have, but it's not the definition of muscle strength. And that's another reason why it's so important. So maybe that we, if you're potentially stronger, then your ability to go for longer is improved. So everything else becomes relatively more sub-maximal. So your fatiguing point might be delayed. It might be that you repeatedly are able to perform um, contractile um, efforts without fatiguing as well but ultimately the definition is really that maximal contractile force in a single effort and that's the definition of muscle strength now obviously we've got other things as well in there so i'm for a kind of endurance um label in there that's the ability to perform multiple actions but obviously they're of a sub maximal uh, force or effort 
because clearly maximal is maximal. To do it over and over and over, you won't be able to do that at maximal. It becomes endurance and high intensity endurance and low intensity endurance. And then obviously we've got muscle power, which is basically the speed of force production. Now, those particular citations are from the ACSM. A multitude or, um, of others are also available. Um, but essentially, that's it. And as I said today, we're going to focus principally on muscle strength with a little bit of focus on muscle power. And within the context of what we're, we're going through right now in this lockdown period, you can almost put people and performance and function on a, on a continuum that goes from almost like complete immobilization. And I hope that um, none of you have, have been mobilized and, and suffered or your, your loved ones have suffered from, from COVID and being completely immobilized. That in itself is a huge topic and something we're not going to touch on today. Um, but it, as you well know, vitally important. What's more likely to have happened to most of the population is this latter end of the continuum where we've got an inactivity in terms of detraining, or indeed a reduced training volume. And we're just gonna explore a little bit about how function and neuromuscular uh, performance might change during these periods of inactivity and or reduced training. So it frames this, this argument, what can we potentially expect back in clinic? So consequences of inactivity. So remember, this is not a mobilization. So this is not kind of casting a limb and, and seeing the dramatic decreases in performance in, in days. This is people still being mobile, still going about their, their business, but not doing any form of structured training. And I'm illustrating this by means of studies that are termed training, detraining studies. So you take a group of people, you put them through a training study. So we're able to control the volume and type of activity they've done beforehand, and then you remove it and see what happens. So I'm not starting with athletes, I'm starting with all the populations. And just last year, incidentally, I've, I've probably picked some of the most hardest surnames, authors with <laughs> surnames hardest to pronounce as uh, we go through this uh, presentation. So I will or won't try to, <laughs> to pronounce them with a Yorkshire accent. I think this is a Greek, <laughs> a Greek uh, author, uh, Kala Paul Pothakaros. Uh, apologies to anybody who speaks Greek for messing that there up. But basically what they did, took a group of older males and put them through a resistance training program of six weeks and then removed that resistance training program and measured them for after six weeks of detraining. So what they saw was remarkably a 44% increase in strength and incidentally just to keep um, things all aligned this is knee extensor data so quadricep data and i'm keeping that uh, consistent throughout just so we're, we're kind of get an idea of, of, of extent of change but what happened then when they removed um, that training was that there was a 25 percent ish reduction in strength so not all of it was lost so you can see that there was an increasing strength through the training, but throughout that detraining period of equivalent duration, about 25% reduction compared to the, the, the new values. The control group who uh, continued training experienced in, uh, further increases, but not quite so much. So this says older males can get stronger. <laughs> and if we remove that uh, training stimulus, it will decrease, the strength will decrease, but possibly not to the same extent to get back to baseline levels. Okay, so let's have a look at another population. Uh, the French author here uh, took uh, a similarly um, similar group of males, slightly younger, <clears throat> but still potentially in that sarcopenic category for some of them, and looked at a double uh, length of training and detraining. So they measured them at eight weeks and measured them at 12 weeks following a resistance training program. They saw a 36% increase in group mean strength in that's in the leg press. And then following a period of 12 weeks detraining, then there was a reduction of about 14% relative to that new level. Again, 
what we're seeing is that strength increased, but if you remove that training stimulus for the same length of time, so that 12 week period, then it's not all lost. There are some decreases, but maybe it doesn't return back to baseline. Finally, one, one last study I just wanted to show you. I remember this is inactivity, so they're still going about their daily business, but not structured training. So this is sedentary older women. Now, here what they did was they trained them for 12 weeks and then they detrained them for a year. So if you're in that situation or your patients in that situation where they're really struggling to get through lockdown, you know, literally exercise rehab is a last thing on the list and the last they're just really trying to just get through it and it might be something they pick up um, in a year's time. What might we be expect to see? So again, a huge increase in, in muscle force in this sedentary older uh, uh, women population um, after 12 weeks of training. And then by a year's time, it had decreased and possibly right back down to baseline levels. Now they didn't measure um, the kind of three quarters of the year. So we could say it takes about a year to lose all of those gains. Um, might take a little bit less time. We're not exactly sure based on this data, but um, so just be mindful of what the background of that individual is. And we'll talk about in, um, individualizing prescriptions as well in a little bit. Okay, so what does that tell us on balance? If we look at this and we look at other related data, I don't want to just chuck out loads of studies at you, it'd be really boring. What's likely to happen in terms of the consequences of lockdown on muscle performance? If we take strength, strength is really important. We'll come on to that in a second. And it's something that's quite easily measured and it underpins a lot of other things. There are likely to be losses to your muscle strength, your patient's muscle strength over this lockdown period, however long that's going to last. Now, something perhaps to be to take heed of but uh, be aware of and also be reassured of perhaps as well is that losses to strength over an acute period are likely to be less than the gains made prior over a similar period so for example if you've got um, a group of patients or a patient that you've given a resistance training program to prior to lockdown and maybe they stuck with it for six weeks eight weeks 12 weeks and they made some real significant gains if they then were unable to perform that same exercise, they were able to go to the gym or your gym, then they will reduce, likely, their strength would likely reduce, but it wouldn't likely drop down to baseline. If, you know, we're kind of, you know, three months period is certainly data to show that, maybe a little bit longer as well. So take heed and it's, it's not likely to drop down to baseline. And just one, of, point, just one point sorry. here. All the people, I always like to check this in, all the people can strength train safely and make significant gains. So passionate about, about this. And that's why I biased the, the presentation of, of um, data on older adults. Resistance training becomes ever more important as people age, sarcopenic effects and the effects that low muscle strength has got on other things. Um, they can make significant gains. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, sorry, Giles. <laughs> Um, so Nikki Fletcher also asked, um, you, you said that, that, that these studies are actually related to, to extensor strength um, yeah. and the quads. Um, did studies look at any other outcomes, for example, fails rate, uh, falls rate? Um, and mm -hmm. is there any sort of mention at, at what stage the decrease in muscle strength correlates to a change in function, for example? Okay, so um, other outcomes are measured in these studies, obviously, or you would hope. Um, you see a similar patterning of change with upper body strength to lower body strength. You see a similar patterning of change of, um, I say similar patterning, maybe not exact same extent, but similar patterning with um, untrained versus trained, so athletes and non-athletes, all the populations. The changes in function where they've been measured uh, tend to follow a similar patterning as well. So those studies uh, I mentioned before, those that have measured functioning, so for example, six minute walk tests, six to sit to stand tests like that, 
there have been improvements of roughly similar percentages in uh, following the resistance training program and roughly similar decrements following the removal of that. Now, in terms of correlation and variation explained, that's a little bit more difficult to do and you do need quite large populations to be able to, to explore that. But um, as I said to, to Giles before, uh, I'll provide all the references for you um, and they'll be shared with you um, subsequently. So you can go and check out the details, uh, details of these papers, some of which are, are open access as well. So hopefully that answers your, uh, your question. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, all the all the references will go on the OSA webinar site. So if there's any any of those you want to look up after players talk, they'll they'll be there for you to see. Cool. Okay. Um, just wanted to flag up um, some elite athlete uh, data as well. I've mentioned there it's a similar pattern of change. Um, so if you've got patients that are in that elite category. Uh, or maybe you're an elite athlete yourself, you've clearly been limited in what you're able to do um, in terms of the exercise. And as I said, that loading is the real issue. Now, this was a, a study that looked at elite male kayakers, so really highly trained individuals. Their training volume was around about seven hours a week of cardiovascular training and two and a half hours a week of strength training. And what they did was, in the off season, they took a group of them and looked at a reduced activity effect on multitude of things, so cardiovascular fitness and power, et cetera, but I'm illustrating muscle strength here for, for parity, um, and put them through a five-week program. So five weeks of doing no training and five weeks of doing a dramatically uh, reduced training. Now, to give you an idea of what that was, it was um, in terms of the strength, it was three lots of 10 repetitions at 12 repetitions maximum load. So a 12 repetitions maximum means literally you can't lift 13, it's that heavy. I'll cover that in a, a little bit more in a, in a second. So what happened to strength performance following uh, these two interventions or one no intervention? Well, the upper body strength, stands to reason you measure upper body because they're kayakers, their upper body strength reduced in five weeks in the no training group by roughly eight to nine percent, so approximately 10 percent. Now, even just performing a tiny, I don't know, maybe it's 20 minutes in total of strength training, strength type training, so resistance training um, in the upper body was sufficient to attenuate those losses by half. So three to absolutely maximum 4% losses in one repetition maximum. So if we're in this lockdown period for a bit longer and you're looking to advise your patients what to do, how to attenuate those losses, um, gyms aren't going to be open for a wee while longer yet, then doing something that's maybe not optimal a little bit of something of resistance training is likely to attenuate the effects. Okay, so other consequences of detraining, I just want to acknowledge them. As I said, we've, we haven't got um, the whole day to cover this, but clearly it's, it's really important to just think about the other things too. I mentioned the, the French study <laughs> before you know, in these older males did a 12 week um, resistance training, 12 week detraining and they also measured power as i mentioned before they also measured function etc but the power changes followed that similar patterning so the extent of adaptation wasn't the same because it wasn't actually the specificity to generate power changes but power changes were also observed and they also saw a decline following detraining which kind of stands to reason and clearly there's going to be changes to other things as well. The latency of which, or the time course of which these changes happen will vary between them. <clears throat> so there might be changes to central drive and that neural input and signaling to the musculature. Over, although over an acute period, there's a question of whether or not actually that could be preserved. Muscle cross-sectional areas, so the hypertrophic effects and size and volume of the muscle uh, can change. Also, connective tissue 
so are we seeing an increase in tendinopathies for example or will you get a glut of us coming into your your uh, clinic because of that uh, loading effect being removed that heavy loading effect and clearly there's there's changes to bone as well and all will de be determined by the length of time of inactivity whether it's total inactivity the individual themselves but it's just to to acknowledge some of these other changes that will be important and of also to acknowledge on an individual basis excuse me <clears throat> so the hierarchy of importance then kind of coming into the second part of this presentation what should we focus on um, and when so as i said before we've got a multitude of things that that make up um the our ability to stabilize joints be resilient against injury be functional perform and when you're looking from a rehabilitation perspective you know you, you've, you're faced with a multitude of things aren't you so that will include things like muscle strength power or rate of force development proprioceptive ab abilities performance-based skills if you're thinking about athletes activities of daily living if you have non-athletes range of motion there's a huge amount of things and you know it's like prioritizing where do we put things like for example muscle strength where can we put that in the program and why and there's any excuse to put this this uh, picture in my slides it's not because of uh, the the woman doing that exercise it for me it's the guy who's got leather shoes on and it clearly looks like he's cut the big toe and heel out of those shoes uh when wearing socks it's it's um it's hilarious anyway <laughs> so um so thinking about then this hierarchy of importance if we try to kind of judge that on on mass uh and to the audience that that you know that's watching this for you guys do you manage, if you think about your own practice, do you manage to individualize the approach for each person that you see? So when you get your patient in your clinic or your, your client in your, in your gym or your setting, do you manage to individualize the rehab pr program for each patient? So you know, be honest, think about it. You know, yes, you do. No, you just absolutely swamped. You don't have time. Maybe you struggle to think about how to do it or sometimes you do. So. <laughs> Um, so we have 65% um, have answered. Uh, I, I hasten to add that I asked Claire to put in the sometimes because she, she put yes and no, I don't have time. So uh, yeah, you can, you can blame the sometimes on me. Um, so we're up to about 75%. So we'll leave that for awesome. another few Thank seconds. Thank you, everyone. And I'll end that one and then share that. So you can see that 66% si said yes, they do individualize their rehab yes. program for each patient. Um, two percent don't always have time, uh, and yeah. thirty-two percent sometimes. I really get that. So, congratulations to I say congratulations. That sounds really patronising, doesn't it? Sorry. Great that those people, the sixty-six. If you put yes, that's awesome. You managed to individualise. Two percent, no, you don't usually have time. I completely get that. Um, that's why some of these things that I'm talking about are so important. In that, I recognise the lack of time you're measuring uh, managing patients on the fly what is it that i can do to help to give you some tools that might enable you to do that and then impact your outcomes so important and then the sometimes i guess that's influenced by timing by resources etc so let's just have a quick follow-up question on that so thank you for answering if we have the next one if you did say yes or let's say sometimes in the part of, of that yes um, Thinking about muscle strength again, where does that come in your thought process or order of importance? Now, assuming clinically you're able to do strength work, um, relative to other things like, you know, your, your uh, hypertrophic work, endurance, other muscle type work and other rehab focus. So assume kind of pains under control, range of motion you're happy with, you can do strength work. Where does it come in order of importance? Like, is it the first thing you think of? Do you not think about it at all? That's the last one. Is it second, third, throughout the program? Just so I can get an idea of, of where you think about strength in, in your, your rehab prescriptions. Okay, so people are scratching their heads a little bit about this one. So we're, we're up That's to okay. about 60%. <laughs> Bearing in mind, there is, there is a proportion of people that, that, that didn't say yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so I'll leave that on for a, a few more seconds. We're up to about 70% there. Brilliant. 
and then I'll stop that. And you can see that 25% um, so that the strength is uh, first in, in order of importance. 16% um, said it was second in order of importance. Third uh, was 4%. And then 54%, so the, the majority, okay. um, said that it's throughout the programme. And then 1% uh, said none of the above. That's really interesting. So thanks so much for answering that. That's really interesting. I might challenge some of that with, with what I'm going to present to you in that. So I did a webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a week ago, that was entitled, maybe some of you watched it, why we shouldn't be focusing on muscle strength at end stage rehab. And I think, so as I said, I'll, I'll give you a framework to, to think about and that might help in prioritizing your thoughts and maybe you don't have to think about strength throughout and maybe i've misinterpreted you maybe you are thinking we'll need to just be mindful of it maybe not structuring the program wholly to um to develop that and obviously each and every patient is, is slightly different with different uh, goals and outcomes but i think you know the first of the i think it's 25 percent of you that said you think about it first that's where I come from. Your strength is, is really, really important. And that's why I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on that today. For me, it, it forms the foundation um, upon which a multitude of other abilities are built. And it can influence the extent of adaptation of other indices of function. So on top of the, if you imagine strength is on the bottom, and then you've got other things that are pretty much layered on top of that and the determine the the extent of adaptation will be determined by how much strength you've got so just take muscle power for example power is a speed of muscle force production and you might be sat there going look that's so important i deal with um older populations i want to stop them from tripping falling over uh, that requires a, a rapid production of force to move that limb segment or right their posture couldn't agree more but if we are not thinking first and foremost about muscle strength, so those people are weak, they're frail, arguably it's a mute point how quickly they can produce muscle force because they don't have enough in the tank to start with. And that's a perspective that, that I come from. Think about muscle strength as the fuel tank. So the, top, the fuller the tank, the greater capacity you or your patients have the more submaximal things become. Like a sit to stand effort could be a, a maximal effort for some straight, uh, frail individuals, but if they get stronger, then they're able to do more of them. It becomes more submaximal. Perhaps they're attenuating the onset of fatigue. The power then can be developed more um, efficaciously. So you're producing more force more quickly than a minimal amount of force re quickly. Um, to no effect on performance and likewise it can influence all other aspects um, strength is important from from that perspective but but also we've got data that shows let's move myself out of the way there um, we've got data that shows it influences other things as well and is related to pain and quality of life so if your patients are those individuals that are older They've got OA, for example, there's a huge amount of data that shows there's a relationship between weakness and uh, a sensation of pain in, a, in an OA knee, the quality of life thereafter. As I said, all these references will be provided for you. Uh, just literally published um, activity of daily living dependency, and this was prospective in design this study. So those uh individuals are measured uh, up to about 25 years or 20 in 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 the moment and then followed up 25 years um subsequently those weaker individuals were more likely to be dependent on help for activities of daily living versus a stronger we've got injury risk potentially so it's difficult one to pin down this one because we can't really um injure people <laughs> you know ethically and measure what their strength was at that moment in time or before um, but retrospectively there's some possible relationship there um, but certainly as well uh, we've got data that shows that muscle weakness or lack of muscle strength influences all-cause mortality as well 
So those are just a few of the key reasons why we, I think, should look at strength first and foremost. But typically what we're taught, certainly in um, personal training, exercise environments, also potentially from some of the more the, the physiotherapy um, qualifications, I don't know if you were taught like this, if you think about what we think about first we look at muscular endurance then we think about hypertrophy then we think about strength and then maybe we think about power and strength is kind of down the line in consideration so what i'm trying to prompt you to do if you don't already is think about that first and foremost you might not need to do anything about it which is absolutely fine but you might do and if you do, then it's better to do that first because of all the things that I've mentioned previously. So therefore, it might be that I think we change that pyramid and strength is at the bottom. And let's focus a majority of time and effort initially on that and then individualize based on that patient's needs and goals. So it might be that, you know, a, a new prescription will be strength. Then we look to, up to power. Then we look at size and we look at, back to strength again in that periodized model. It might be something else, it might be something else, but all of these are valid approaches relative to that individual in front of you. It might be that you never get out of the strength phase. You know, I certainly am struggling to do that with 12 weeks with OA knee patients, and that's completely fine, but their, their functional imp uh, uh, improvements have been made. The pain has gone down, but that's individualized to them. And... Um Yep, Sorry. Um, yeah, so, um, so Jake Wall asks, um, how do you recommend measuring strength within, within the clinic? Uh, is it Oxford scale, handheld dynamometer, rep yeah. to max? Or what, what, what yeah, so that's really good. Do? Really good point there. Um, you don't know how much you've changed unless you've made, or your patient has changed unless you've measured them. And um, I've written a couple of posts. So if you haven't uh, seen my blog, go to getbacktosport.com and click on the S&C blog. I've written a two posts on measuring strength and how to do it. Now, um, you can do it in a multitude of ways. In a clinic setting, handheld dynamometry is a good option. That said, we need to use dynamometry in a way that limits and controls all extraneous variables that make the score less reliable, should we say. So that includes trying to remove you as an experimenter and tether the handheld dynamometer something to something immovable make sure that the person is seated or in a position whereby their body position is stable and nothing's going to move you go through a standardized procedure and take a, a mean of several measures you give them a learning process all of that's in in um, some of the the uh, articles that i've written so that's a great way to do it if you have only access to perhaps gym kit, then uh, a one rep max can work. If you can't elicit, elicit a, a one rep max because of stuff like pain maybe, then a three rep max or even a five rep max potentially. I certainly use three rep max with, with my um, OA patients just because that's all that we've got available in, that mom, um, in the uh, gym setting at that moment and also for time reasons. So yeah, really good question. Hopefully that, that answers somewhat. Mm -hmm. um so quickly then on to the how you start to determine what's important and when and uh this is hopefully published this year a chapter for el salvia's uh, sports medicine textbook now whilst it's sports medicine and sport performance this applies for me for all for all populations how do you start to think about what to focus on and when and if you look here, and this I mentioned before, periodization. So within the sport performance literature, we uh, and uh, within athletes, we periodize training so that we're optimizing outcomes, optimizing performance, commensurate with an end goal. So if that end goal's a particular race meet or a particular competition at a period of time, then we work backwards and periodize strength work or maybe speed work, etc. The same can be really usefully applied into rehabilitation. And this is a way that I think is, is a nice way to, to think about it. Assuming you've got all these things under control, so you're happy that the pain's controlled, 
you know, the function, the gate, that's all okay. There's acute phase and angry phases out of the way. How do you start to prioritize your thoughts? Look at the, the size of arrow. And that gives you almost like the size of um, prioritization. And clearly, early phase through to uh, end phase can be, you know, it's, it's different for different uh, situations, different injuries, different rehabs. But generically speaking, we've got a few things to think about. Muscle strength, you might have power or rate of force development. You've got sensory motor ability, so that's like kind of static proprioception. And then for me, you've got the performance related sensory motor ability. So yes, it's performance in a sports setting, but in a um, non-sports setting, that might be related to activities of daily living. So if we just focus on that early phase, the biggest arrows or the biggest block of focus, we're, we're looking at strength and we're then thinking about the, the balance, proprioceptive abilities. So that, help i think helps to formulate your thoughts we, we we don't want to do too many things all at once such that we're overloading the system we're overloading the patients and we're, we're minimizing the, the adaptations that that patient and system can make we're not really focusing on muscle power in this early phase we don't need to there will be some adaptation caused by a strength stimulus but it's not something we're we're really bothered about nor are we bothered about people twisting, turning, changing directions, responding to perturbations that are unexpected in this early phase. However, when we progress through to the end phase, then power might be really important. So when I talked about that older person stepping up out of the chair and being able to produce force quickly, we've already put in place that, that strength capacity. Now we're learning how to express it quickly. So that speed of force production and indeed, maybe if you've got a sporting population, you want to run people through those, those um, activity-specific environments where they are twisting, turning, changing direction, responding to perturbations, and expressing and using that capacity that you've built for them or they've built in a functionally meaningful way. And we're just doing a maintenance of strength. Okay, so that might just be a single session or half session on uh, on strength for using compound exercises we haven't got the time to go into unfortunately all the different um, uh, permutations there but it just illustrates a way that might be useful for you to prioritize and think about your thoughts and then prioritize sorry think about your outcomes and prioritize your thoughts in a way that you can structure your program through um, early through to late phase okay so a last Last few slides, then last couple. So clearly we're asking the question now, so what can we do to optimize these outcomes? And I'll also acknowledge that we're probably limiting, are limited for loading options. As I said before, we want to minimize this uh, scattered approach where we're throwing loads of things at people asking to do loads of things and then we're, we're risking overwhelm we're not hitting the target they're not making great adaptations maybe a little bit of adaptation but we're wasting all this time and effort what we want to do is really hit that nail on the head or the bullseye be specific about what we want to achieve for them and then design the program accordingly specificity is the key now ideally under normal circumstances, when we can get into the gym, when we've got loading options available to us, that strength adaptation is going to be caused by a three to five repetitions maximum type of loading. So that's really heavy. And yeah, old people can do that. <laughs> they can. A progressive approach, old people can get there. Non-trained individuals or untrained individuals with a progressive approach, they can get there. So we're, we're scared of overloading patients. And I think that what that does with that hesitancy, it just limits how much gains they get, how, how much of a gain they can make. So if we really are specific about what we're doing, really loading individuals up will generate that strength stimulus. Now, the smaller the text, the smaller the stimulus. If we're looking at that kind of 10 to 12 rep max, assuming it's max, 10 to 12 repetitions, it's not really doing anything all that optimally. Now, you may be shouting at me, yeah, but 8 to 12 reps, or so 12 reps is ideal for hypertrophy, so that's muscle size adaptation. Yes, it can be, but recent research is really showing that actually if you volume match, 
three to five rep max programs and uh, uh, 10 to 12 rep max programs, you get a similar change in the size of the musculature. And actually 12 repetitions maximum is more of a, a muscular endurance, high intensity muscular endurance stimulus. Um, so incidentally, if you, if you want this explained a little bit more, you want that on a, on a, a handout on a sheet, I've got that 14 page guide um, towards the end. I think um, Stuart might kindly put the, the website link up there. It's just getbacktosport.com. You can download that for free and it's for therapists as well. So that's normally what we would do. Now, <clears throat> also you've got to take into, into consideration the characteristics of the setting you're in. So your program characteristics, your patient characteristics, where they're coming from, what level of training have they got, what's the, what are their clinical limitations. Then you're thinking about resources, time, personnel, equipment, which is so pertinent right now. What's, you know, if we, if, if we take the ideal prescription, what is that for strength adaptation? Okay, did you get it? I'm joking, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> so the ideal, broadly speaking, and it obviously depends if we're really optimizing outcomes, we want three to five repetitions maximum, around about three to five sets per muscle group. Make sure you've got sufficient rest in between each set, else you're gonna be getting diminishing returns. So those fast twitch motor units, the ones we want to recruit for that maximal adaptation to strength, also to power, they fatigue quickly. So we're really talking about at least a minute and a half rest, if not quite a bit more and maybe twice a week or once a week, depending who it is. And I said in, in red at the bottom, that it really depends on the baseline training status to the absolute uh, ideal dose response. Now, we're in a period of lockdown. We don't have access to gyms. I just wanted to flag up a study that's um, online first right now, so it's not even published in print. Um, but Kubo uh, et al., um, a very esteemed author, um, I think I just mentioned this, didn't I? Volume match training. So we're answering the question, he, or he's asking the question, what happens if we match the training loads um, on a, a bench press and look at um, higher loading versus lower loading? So here we've got four repetitions maximum loading, eight repetitions maximum loading. So remember, Four repetitions, maximum is he so heavy that you can't lift safely and with correct form, five is that heavy. Eight repetitions, same again. 12 repetitions, obviously it's lighter. And they measured a few things, including muscle strength and also cross-sectional area. Now they put them through a two week of customization to the training, but then eight weeks of two times a week training and it's not exactly matched when I've cal gone back and calculated the exact number of repetitions, but it's not far off. So what you see is this cross-sectional area. There's no difference when you volume match um, between a very heavy resistance training program and one that's not quite as heavy. So that means that that hypertrophy, we have to stick at you know, 12 repetitions maximum for that. Actually, it's not quite true, certainly for the upper, upper limb. Um, but what I wanted to, to flag up to you was, one, the strength gains with that specificity for heavier loading is, is clear. So you've got a much greater strength gain at 27% uh, uh, ish, uh, the four repetitions max, compared to 12 repetitions maximum. But, in this period of lockdown where we're limited on loading, it's not optimal, but it's some. So the challenge becomes then, can we think creatively to generate load? So if we're not able to load up that heavy, be reassured that some heavy resistance work or reasonably heavy resistance work will generate some strength adaptation, probably some changes in cross-sectional area, maybe not so much if you reduce the loading, can you think of a way to take them up to that, that level? I think creatively with home exercises, with backpacks, with children maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and, and incidentally, um, I just wanted to show you this, this study again. So where we've got the training and detraining, what they did with these, these guys was retrain them again. 
So thinking about then your patients that have done your awesome rehab program, they made such gains and then unfortunately they've had to stop for three months because they just don't have the facilities to be able to do what you want them to do. But then when they come back to you after three months, you start them again. What's the possibilities? So remember, you've got good at the adaptation. Detraining causes detraining and a loss of that adaptation, and a, but not completely. And then over an equivalent period of, of training, you might actually get a better gain. So it shows you that that gain is, or that regain is, in, is possible. So not all is lost. Okay, so I've probably talked at you for, for far too long now. So let's just, just kind of summarize some of those points. <clears throat> so what we were trying to identify, likely consequences of lockdown, lockdown, <laughs> Irish, lockdown on muscle performance. Well, we will see, in, I'm absolutely certain that with reduced activity, with no specific strength, um, maintenance programs we're going to see a decrease in strength we're going to see a decrease in power we'll probably see <clears throat> excuse me a decrease in or an increase in muscle switch on times um, but with a good background of training so if you've been working with your patients for a wee while they've been diligent in adhering then just be reassured and they can be reassured that not all is lost certainly over an acute period and they likely will regain what they've lost in half the time maybe. Though, if you want to ad uh, adopt a, a conservative approach, go with a one-to-one -one ratio. So if they've had the 12 week period of, of deconditioning, just make sure there's a 12 week period of reconditioning built in, just so you've got a bit of margin for error, et cetera. Um, the second thing was hierarchy of importance, what to focus on and, and when. Well, I presented the argument that we should look at muscle strength first and foremost, and then individualize thereafter. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't individualize to start with, we, we really should. Uh, but strength so often gets overlooked, and we so often... Um, well, if we overlook it, we can limit their adaptations and what else we want to do with them. It might be, as I said, that you don't need to think about strength. Maybe that, that person is acutely injured or has just had a couple of weeks rest. And you don't really need to think about muscle strength. It's something else, which is absolutely fine. But make sure it's in that decision making process. And then finally, optimize outcomes. Really, the key is specificity. Now, that specificity means we're being specific about what we want to try and achieve through the design of programs that elicit the right overload and also the progression. As I said, it's in that guide. Make sure you download it and it'll give you a, a, several examples and a clear explanation how to do that. And this specificity and these principles apply to everything. So it's not just muscle strength, it's muscle endurance. It can be flexibility, cardiovascular fitness, learning a language. <laughs> we need to be thoughtful in the way that we design programs so that the adaptations that people make will be optimized the time it takes to reach them will be minimized so you'll do it in a quicker time and you save time and effort in in redundancy and, and people doing things ineffectively so um so concludes my presentation uh really really happy to take um questions just a thank you for for sticking with us and uh, i hope that was of use to you and yeah we, if there's any questions giles um, um we we have a few yeah so um there are a few uh, so there have a few questions so uh nick milton uh says basically that his 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 clinic isn't based in a gym uh and most of the people don't have access to equipment at home or at gym uh you know very similar to a lockdown situation um, what are your opinions on, on body weight exercises as take home options? And there have been a few other questions as well um, about um, using towels or isometric exercises with those sorts of things. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on those? OK, so, yeah, we really need to think creatively, don't we? So um, and I get this asked this question all the time um, because of the very reasons that you, you've said. Um, sorry, who was it? Um, it was Nick Milton. Nick, Nick. 
I get asked these questions all the time. So body weight exercises, um, unless someone is really quite frail and you're taking them to that, that level uh, and it is difficult, so sit to stand, for example, um, you go into five repetitions, it's not going to be an optimal strength stimulus. It might help you with a buy-in and it might help them adopt a new pattern of behavior that you want them to stick with and you can build on that and you can build in resistance. But um, doing, it goes, it's related to the intensity at which the musculature is working. So if somebody's able to complete 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, you really need to question the efficacy of that exercise. It might be that you're doing it for some other reason, which is completely fine. But if the specificity is to build strength or it's to build power or hypertrophy, you need to get that loading and that intensity right to cause that neuromuscular adaptation. So um, you can think about adapting home exercise by using weighted backpacks. Um, I invented a, a shopping bag for life deadlift for a couple of patients uh, with loads of bottles of water or books, equally weighted, of course, a, a bag in each hand. Um, and then isometrics is a really good uh, way of adapting exercise. So maximally contracting the musculature at a, a joint angle that is comfortable is better than nothing. Longer muscle lengths tend to um, promote adaptation across the range to shorter muscle lengths so for the knee a more flex position for quads for example um so yeah you've got quite a few options it's just how you think creatively and and, and solve that logistic challenge on how, how you can do it okay great um and andrew appleyard asked um would you work on strength similarly uh, for small muscles like super uh, supraspinatus for example uh, compared to large muscle groups like glutes or quads yeah good question again it comes to the assessment of that individual the background the end goals and um what the what are the performance demands and injury risks that they're going to to go back to um, clearly the the musculature that you've mentioned has got the need to have a high uh, intensity endurance um, capability possibly more so than other muscle groups so it might be that specificity favors that however if you think about the the fuel tank being that capability that that influencing all other things i don't think there's a reason to not address strength so separately might want to work on muscle strength um, such that it influences potentially the uh, susceptibility to fatigue, prolonging that, making a high intensity endurance, etc. So I think it depends on the individual, but, but I think strength is still relevant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you mentioned that, that you sometimes modify uh, your... Um, three to five reps uh, to max load uh, in patients. You, you gave the example of your OA patients, um, but do you, do you make changes to those if you're the patient's in pain or kinesiophobic, for example? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so there's a whole lot of work as, you're, you know, as everybody watching knows to get that buy-in from the individual. So honestly, I don't care what they do in the first session. I just want them to come back for the second session. So we run this program in a gym environment and that can be really intimidating for people that have never been to a gym before. And potentially those people that are fearful, that have got pain. So it's all about them coming back for a second session and a third session and establishing that behavior change. So for some people, they'll get there really quickly. Some people, it might take a couple of weeks. And invariably what we find is that um, certainly with a, an OA, population uh, the warm-up is, is really important so that would be if they can get the knee around the crank cycle we do a bit of cycling first but also uh, a warm-up on the exercise you want them to do so knee extension exercises are you know the program the, the core program they follow knee extension hamstring curls and and leg press and they're each individual's limited slightly you know differently according to pain um, but one really good tip is do a sub-maximal warm-up on the exercise that they're doing. So 
on any extension, get them to lift some weight <clears throat> throughout the range. And that can really help with um, down regulating that, that pain response, that fear. And um, then you can limit, you know, if they're in so much pain and clearly close kinetic chain and compressive exercise can evoke that a little bit more, just limit the range. And what you'll find typically is that people get stronger, the pain goes down and the range of motion increases. So there's ways in which you can adapt the exercise. We never compromise on loads when we're in that strength training phase. So we just modify the exercises and I run several courses online and in person on how you can do this because clearly you're not in a situation, you're dealing with patients that have got clinical restrictions, pain, all sorts of issues that are not that healthy fit ideal person that's going to go into a gym. You've got to think creatively <clears throat> and keep the best program for your patient and get them to adhere and get them to come back. You've got the hardest job of all. So we don't compromise on specificity. We change the way in which the exercise is performed to work around the issues that the patient have, has got. Okay. Brilliant. Um, there've also been quite a few questions uh, with regards to blood flow restriction training um, okay. in maximizing strength and gains uh, with lighter, more tolerable loads. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on those mm. sorts of techniques? Yeah, I love it. Love it. It's got to be done well. It's got to be done um, with, you've got to have experience of, of doing it. Um, the physiologically then, so for those that don't know what blood flow restriction training is, it's occluding the blood supply to the exercise muscle um, whilst they're uh, performing contractions and it's around about a 40% occlusion. So you need to be able to do that precisely uh, with the right measurements of, of blood flow with Doppler and an occlusion cuff. So it requires a little bit of uh, investment in kit. It also requires some in investment in terms of, of expertise. Now the potential is great such that um, if you've got, rightly so, some of the, the people have mentioned that, if you've got people that are in pain and they're struggling to elicit a maximal contraction, um, the evidence suggests that through a period of, or an exercise program using blood flow restriction, then you can get similar gains or some gains at least by doing a 30% of a maximal effort whilst the blood flow is occluded um, for a greater number of repetitions versus them going much, much heavier without that occlusion. And you can get strength gains and hypertrophic gains by, by doing that. So there, there's great potential in blood flow restriction training. I wouldn't rely on it wholly because what you're not doing then, if you think about that, that loading, we said right at the beginning, thinking about the connective tissues, the tendons, um, and that loading into the, the, the musculoskeletal system is required for other adaptations. Um, so you just be cognizant of that and it can be a nice introduction and a starter for people to get stronger who are struggling. Okay, fantastic. So perhaps the perhaps the last question. There's still there's still quite a few, and we'll we'll send those over um, okay. uh, to see if we can get answers afterwards. Um, so this question, last question from Dan Torpy. Um, have you got a protocol for assessing uh, assessing one rep max in older population? Um, can it be done effectively in one session because you're trying to coach technique and avoid fatigue, um, or does it require a second session in order to get an accurate measure? Um. So with the population that I deal with that are older, they tend to have an OA knee um, or an OA hip, uh, but generally it's OA knees. And we probably wouldn't rely on that measure in the first session because there's so much familiarization and people are just, you know, they're, they're unfamiliar. There's a huge learning effect. So quite, quite right there um, on that. It is possible, yes. Um, what we tend to do, however, is take a three rep max um, because one rep max can be a little bit challenging. But in terms of just a, an asymptomatic older population, absolutely, you can do that. Warm them up and then follow that, that protocol of, uh, and again, an activity specific warm up. So if it's a, a leg extension, extension, that's a nice, safe way of doing it. Um, 
and then you progressively increase the load. Now there's several ways you can do it. You can Google, um, I think I might even have a post on my site about that, um, about how to measure uh, strength. But you can progressively increase the load, um, but make sure you're giving sufficient rest periods in between so you, you're, not, you're avoiding that uh, fatigue. So it depends on the familiarity. It is possible, but it, it might not be possible with everybody, depending on their resistance training background, their fear and familiarity. So I, I wouldn't avoid giving it a go, however. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Claire Mitchell. Fascinating talk. It really generated a lot of questions uh, from everyone. So we'll try and pass those on uh, for answers if we can. Um, Absolutely, so my thank pleasure. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Really fascinating. Um, so this has been the eighth in our current series of Key Opinion Leader webinars. Um, over the last eight weeks, we've been watched by over 4,000 attendees um, and had eight amazing talks from some of the most respected leaders in their fields. Um, speaking with you as customers uh, and keeping an eye on the situation across the whole of the North Europe region, it looks like life is starting to go back uh, to some degree of normality. Um, and as you guys are starting to go back to work, uh, with that in mind, uh, we are too. Um, all of the sessions so far have been conducted from my house. This is, this is my house, believe it or not. Um, and from now, we're actually able to access some of the facilities that we've been doing webinars from the last three years or so. Um, so this allows us to be a bit more flexible um, to your wants and needs um, and a bit more innovative in terms of the content that we can deliver. So we're therefore um, going to move these sessions to, to 7 p.m. Um, UK time every Wednesday um, and we'll begin to incorporate more practical elements that, that many of you have asked for um, um, as well as the normal key opinion leader input. Um, you should receive an email um, in the coming week outlining the schedule for the next month or so. Um, we ha uh, have to extend our massive debt of gratitude to the eight fantastic speakers um, that we've had over the last eight weeks. Um, you know, they've been incredibly generous to, to give us their time uh, and also talk on, on their specific su uh, subjects. So we've had quite a real variety of, of great speakers from all, all different walks of uh, of healthcare really. Um, if you want to look at any of the previous webinars, I, I know we just flashed up uh, the titles uh, from some of the previous ones. They're all available on the Oster Academy YouTube account. Um, you can also access uh, via the Oster Academy uh, webinar page. Um, one of the good things about going on there is you actually have access to um, all the any of the references that have been used throughout it. There's also some reference material in there as well, um, or support material to go along with that. So um, we'll perhaps put in the link to, to some of the things that, that Claire mentioned today. Um, but yeah, do, do go to those resources uh, and you can access those in the meantime. But thank you for watching. Um, we'll see you next week for something slightly different. Thank you very much. <laughs>